Good morning, Vince. Good morning. So we can hear me. You can hear me yes. okay, right? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so I'm trying to hold this position. So okay. <laughs> So we have about 37 folks on the call right now, um, and I've started the uh, YouTube live stream. So those uh, who aren't on the Zoom can now uh, view the stack meeting for October. Okay. And I'm about to start the recording for the call. Well. We'll give them another minute and then we'll start. Sounds good, thank you. Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, I'm, Vince, I'm Vince Rogalski, and I'm chairman of the STAC, and also chairman of the Gunnison Valley Transportation Planning Region. Um, and we have uh, Commissioner Stewart uh, also attending. Uh, Commissioner, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Chair. It's Karen Stewart. I'm a uh, commissioner for District 4, which is Adams County, Boulder County, Broomfield County, and I'm the chair of the commission. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Okay, so we'll go down. I'll go down the list. Uh, Dr. Cog. Elise Jones is here. Uh, good morning, Elise. Roger morning. Is here. Central, front, Central Front Range. Dick Elsner is here. Okay, Eastern TBR. Uh, it's Chris Richardson here. Okay. Uh, Grand Valley. Dean Bressler is here. Uh, Intermountain. Intermountain here. Okay. Uh, North Front Range. Hi, uh, Dave Parks here. Okay, uh, Northwest. Heather Sloop is here. Mike Speak. Good morning, and Normstein, uh, Stack Vice Chair, present. Okay, um, Pueblo area. Uh, good morning, Vince and everybody else. Uh, Terry Hart and John Adams are here for Pape Dog. Okay, good morning. Uh, San Luis Valley. Good morning, Michael Yon here. Keith Baker's also there. Okay. <laughs> South Central. This is Walt with for South Central, Walt Bolden. Southeast. Okay, Southwest. Good morning, Sarah Dodson here. Uh, upper Front Range. Southern Ute. Ute Mountain. 
Good morning. This is Archie House Jr., Ute Mountain Ute Tribe. Hey, good morning. Uh, let's see. We'll go back here to Inner Mountain. Okay. Um, southeastern. Upper Front Range. Southern Ute. So we have a few that are, that are missing. Um, next item on the agenda is approval of the September minutes. The September minutes were sent out electronically to everyone. And um, is there a motion to approve? So I moved. Second. Snorm. Heather. Okay, Heather moved and Norm seconded. Um, is there any corrections or additions? Hearing none, all those who are not in favor of approving the minutes, please say something. Okay, I'll consider the uh, minutes approved. Okay, uh, next item, um, current events update, Herman. Yeah, good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm going to be pretty quick this morning, but I do have a couple things just to let you know about, and some of which you probably already know. Um, you probably heard that Congress approved and the President signed the this month the one-year extension of the FAST Act. So good news that we have an extension, though I think it also effectively puts on the back burner the need for any acting on any special relief legislation for transportation in the next few months. Um, not that I think we thought that was gonna happen anyway, but I think this makes it a little less likely, but we are happy to have that extension and not you know, a two weeks and then a month and then another couple of weeks. So this, that's good news for us. Um, you remember last month, you all received a briefing on the greenhouse gas pollution reduction roadmap, and that is out for public comment now. Um, so that's, of course, the goal of cutting pollution by 26% by 2025 and 50% by 2030. So um, you might want to check that out if you're interested. Um, uh, next week, uh, the TC is expected to vote on our favorite topic, uh, regional priority program formula. <laughs> uh, you remember that previously the TC voted down a couple of options, uh, which effectively left the current formula in place. Um, but the current formula, when it was approved several years ago, was, was related to the last plan. So now that we've added years with the, the adoption of a new plan, the MPOs in particular um, kind of need some certainty on what that formula is. So staff's memo as we've prepared it in the resolution is to uh, approve the and continue the existing formula. Um, that's what's on the table for commission now. Uh, however, we're prepared, whatever the commission decides to do, um, uh, we're prepared to act on whatever they, whatever they decide and we'll adjust accordingly. And then uh, lastly, uh, we have a new staff announcement. So Steve Harrelson has selected Keith Stefanik as our new deputy chief engineer. Uh, so we're excited to have Keith uh, on in that new capacity, but it certainly leaves a hole for us on the Central 70 project that he's been leading so we'll need to fill that. Um, and then just apologies, there's a two or three of us that are gonna need to drop off uh, a little bit early today. So if you see a few of us drop off, it's not a reflection on any presentations that are happening around 11 or 11.30, but we do have a couple conflicts uh, uh, this morning. So uh, I think that's it. Happy to answer any questions anybody might have. Though. Questions for Herman? I have one. Yes. Heather. You knew I'd ask, right, Herman? Of course, sure. So I don't understand why the staff's recommending something that's counter to what Stack recommended for RPP. Uh, uh, what's what staff recommended that the commission voted down several months ago was the Stack recommendation. Um, 
we're not going to bring back the same recommendation that they voted down a few months ago. Um, so the only thing that is left that has been talked about is the current formula. So that's what we're bringing to them. It's not necessarily a recommendation that that's what they adopt. That's, that's the thing that's left. And we leave it to our, our um, extremely capable chair <laughs> of the commission to, uh, to manage that. And, and if there's any changes, we'll make those changes. Um, but we've, we've kind of left it up to the commission to see what they want to do. Other questions for Herman? Okay, moving yeah, thanks. on. Thanks, Herman. Uh, Transportation Commission reports. So what was sent out to you, the notes from the uh, um, commission report for last month, the September, um, with uh, Wednesday workshops and then Thursday's meeting. And one of the things they talked about is uh, roll forward to uh, deal with the budget to move stuff from 2020 to 2021. And so that's in there, nothing surprising. Um, next topic was the national performance measures. I'll see that measures both the national performance measures and also drivability life. And so we continue to, to use both of the measures. Um, one has one other element that uh, the other does not. Now, one of the things um, that came up also in discussion about that is if the interstate pavement <coughs> aren't maintained the less than 5% poor, CDOT would need to divert other payment funds and um, for interstate, interstate payment, pay, excuse me, pavement maintenance, which would greatly hurt the regions. And so we have to keep the interstates to a certain level in order to make sure that the, the rest of the money that we have goes to um, other areas in the state. Um, directive uh, PD-14, uh, there was a discussion there and one of the things there is um, the discussion about actually what does the environment uh, suggestion for new environmental impacts was talked about. And one of the things that was brought out is the fact that uh, CDOT has little control over most of the environmental impacts. Now, it's true that we have some of the greenhouse gas stuff uh, because of the uh, automobiles, but the majority of the rest of it, uh, CDOT has very little control over. So we're gonna have to work on how we deal with some of those kinds of things. Um, we have a virtual tour of operation centers. And um, if you haven't seen it, um, it's really an impressive uh, control center, both in uh, Pueblo and um, in the front range up here. They, they really have control or visual uh, access to most of the highways in the state. They can really dispatch stuff and really look at what they need to do to do that. And uh, it was an impressive thing. So uh, if you ever get a chance to, to sign on and visit the, the movie that they put together, it's very impressive. Um, let's see. Um, so one of the one of the commissioners, transportation commissioners, has resigned because he's moving from moving from the state. And Commissioner Stewart read a resignation letter from Commissioner Halter into the record at his request, and so that's also included in your uh, packet. Um, executive director's report, one of the things, um, executive director, uh, um, vice chair Hall, uh, commissioner Stewart, and um, Mike Goldsby did a little tour of some of the parts of region three. And one of the things that the uh, director Lou uh, said that Director Liu agreed that a little bit of money can go a long way on the Western Slope. 
Now, I think um, that statement can be uh, said about any of the rural areas in the state, including the Eastern Plains, uh, because we have different situations in which the, um, the maintenance or the redoing of state highways um, is not as expensive in the rural community as it is in the metropolitan community. Uh, Herman talked about the uh, new person or deputy director, director, chief engineer, and who that might be. And um, let's see, I can't find his name right now. Uh, Stef Stefanik. Um, and so that's in place. That's that's a new position, I think. And um, that'll help out a lot in terms of trying to get everything done in the state. Um, high performance transportation enterprise had a little report. And, and uh, then Federal Highways also had a little report and talked about the two build grants that were received. One $13 million to Roaring Fork Transit Authority. And a, let's see. 5.4 million to Castle Rock for a study of a new proposed interchange on I-25. Um, they went on to do the official meeting on Thursday and all the resolutions were approved. Um, nothing much different there. And so uh, that's the report, uh, questions. Oh, we're moving right along. Okay, uh, TPR representatives, uh, the report from each of the TPRs. We'll start here with Dr. Cobb. All right, good morning, everyone. Elise here. Um, at our September meeting, uh, the Dr. Cog board approved a TIP amendment adding 29 and a half million of SB 267 monies to reconstruct the I-70 bridge over Harlan Street in Wheat Ridge. As you may know, this is a priority project for CDOT due to the poor condition of the bridge. Um, the board also awarded 4.3 million in FTA 531 and service transportation block grant funds to 16 different projects and programs for transportation services to seniors, individuals with disabilities, veterans, and low-income individuals. And then finally, the board uh, awarded almost 14 million to projects that improve signal systems operations in the region through the Regional Transportation Operations and Technology Program. So that's the news from Dr. Cog. Okay, Central Front Range. Thank you, Mr. Dick. Chairman. This is Dick Elsner. Um, not a lot going on in the Central Front Range. We're starting to get ready for winter and I am uh, really hoping that the leaf season is over. Um, some of the backups we've had uh, on 285 were, I, mean, I complained last time about them, they became monumental this time. Uh, it's an issue that I think CDOT is really gonna have to start addressing because uh, we've got some areas that could use just a little money for a great deal of improvement that would in increase the safety. We've got some areas, um, especially like the top of Kenosha Pass that are uh, really critical uh, from a safety standpoint. But other than that, everything is going well. Hopefully we'll get some rain and snow so everybody's fires can go out. Good, uh, Eastern TPR. Uh, this, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Chris Richardson. Uh, again, pretty quiet month. Or Last meeting, our major action was to approve our regional transportation plan and transit plans. So that's all I've got to report. Okay, Grand Valley. Yeah, Dean Bressler here in the Grand Valley. Um, so we have done well with revitalizing Main Street project grants. Uh, as probably everyone knows, those were intended to be um, sort of quickly deployed $50,000 chunks, and the city of Grand Junction has received two of those, um, and the projects have been pretty well developed already um, within the city. City of Fruit have received one. Their project is, has been completely rolled out, um, you know, kind of fast and cheap construction to 
uh, enable diners to, um, you know, to, to eat outside. And while we still have some good weather on the Western Slope, uh, and I believe the uh, town of Palisade has received one as well for their uh, downtown area. Our multimodal options fund projects are all underway. All of the uh, roadway infrastructure, I should say, you know, shared use paths, et cetera, sidewalk projects uh, are under contract and moving forward. The Grand Valley Transit uh, transit project, however, we're, we're still waiting on um, uh, contracting there at headquarters. And, and then the Grand Valley MPO is gonna lead a Safe Routes to School uh, grant application, a non-infrastructure grant application that will include the development of an app to help students find the safest route to school. We have a lot of missing sidewalks, areas where, um, where there's no safe shoulder, and this app would seek to, um, to show in real time um, you know, the, the best, safest route to, uh, to a given school. Um, and it'll include a lot of other elements. So we think that's pretty, um, you know, should be a, you know, a good and innovative project that will accomplish a lot for um, fairly low budget in the range of 100 to $150,000. And those are due in early November, as probably most all stack members know. And that's it. Thanks, Vince. Thanks, Dean. Okay, uh, Intermountain. Somebody from Intermountain joined us? Okay, North Run Range. Yeah, thanks, Vince. Uh, this is Dave Clark here. Uh, the North Front Range Planning Council, we held our first hybrid meeting on, on October 1st for our meeting. So uh, some of our members were met, met in person, others uh, joined uh, remotely, and it worked out pretty well. At the meeting, we talked, uh, there was a discussion of the recently released uh, greenhouse gas emission roadmap. So we're working on that uh, to get our comments back to the, um, the, count, the commission on that. Uh, there's a lot of uh, issues in there that affect us transportation wise, so we're taking a close look at that to get our comments. Uh, also at the same meeting, we uh, discussed the transportation services for vulnerable populations. Um, it, and it was included some seniors funding approved by the Transportation Commission. Our MPO receive, will receive about $115,000 for the region, so we're working with uh, CDOT on that. Uh, the week of September 20, 20th to 26th, the North Front Range MPO staff partnered with the City of Greeley and the City of Loveland on the NOCO Active Transportation Challenge to encourage people across the region to switch uh, at least one car trip to a biking, walking, or bus trip. And there were 112 participants from 13 communities uh, the city of Greeley came in first place with the most participants, trips, and total miles. So it was a little bit of a challenge up here for that. And finally, uh, construction on the overall North I-25 segment six, seven, and eight projects continue to move forward. On October 5th and 6th, just a couple of days ago, there were overnight closures uh, from Crossroads to US 34. We set some, or they set some new girders on the I-25 bridge for the railroad that crosses at that location. And then last night, October 8th, the virtual public meeting uh, was held by CDOT on the next phase of the North I-25 project. So got a lot going on up here and that's our report. Thank you, Vince. Thanks, Dave. Um, Northwest, Heather. Hi, so um, we're still in full construction season and um, Let's see, 13 has construction, 131 has construction, 40 has construction, all the way from Steamboat to Granby, there's cone zones. Um, 14 is closed. We are, as I look out my window, all the fire doesn't look bad right now. But uh, we're surrounded by fires from the east, the north, and the west. Yesterday, um, the fire over by Mad Creek on the, in the Circle Wilderness area increased 3,000 acres in a matter of hours. Um, so air pollution here is, we were at 566 yesterday, let's just say that. Um, it's really bad up here. Uh, hopefully 
the fires will go out when the snow flies, but you all know I hope it never does. Well, the snow at least. Um, anyway, other than that, we're just full construction season going straight through. Nothing really um, exciting to report other than, I mean, at least locally in Steamboat, um, we had a very big pinch point on US 40 going through town um, from the west, especially in the mornings with uh, school and work traffic. They have, CDOT has um, done a great job of doing a chip seal and adding an additional lane um, for commuters to come in. So we don't have that double to single pinch point at, um, at the start of uh, downtown. So there will hopefully be happy faces once the striping is done, hopefully this week. Um, but other than that, everybody's just working toward buttoning up projects before the snow flies and hoping that the fires are subsiding soon. Thanks, Vince. Thanks, Heather. Uh, Pike Speak. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Norm Seen, Pike Speak. Uh, we have not held a uh, board meeting since our last act. Uh, so a few interim comments. Um, one of the projects in the Peck Creek region is a MAMSIP. That's the Military Access Mobility Safety Improvement Program, MAMSIP. Uh, part of the funding of that was the BUILD grants that we were successful in uh, last spring. Uh, the first of those projects has begun. Um, several on that list of projects under the MAMSIP group. Uh, we're also finishing up the uh, resurfacing of US Highway 24. That's uh, up the pass from Colorado Springs West. Up in Taylor County, uh, two two of those projects are just finishing up, and uh, you've had heard from buttoning up uh, for the season. Uh, we did a little scare. We had a, a possible arsonist uh, fire uh, in the Ute Pass area. Um, so it's uh, you know it, it's enough when they're naturally caused. When you got people who are um, taking those steps, it's just uh, a little crazy. So I. I uh, we're, we're watching fires around the state and wish everybody the best to succeed in those. Uh, ask, keep our thoughts and prayers for our firefighters in the midst of that and homeowners. Thank you. Thanks, Norm. Okay, uh, Pueblo area, Terry. Thanks, Vince. Uh, just a few things to report. Um, our Highway 50 project, uh, it's uh, going west out of Pueblo uh, through Pueblo West. Uh, that's an expansion project and a uh, improvement project at the intersection with uh, Purcell Boulevard there in um, Pueblo West. That's uh, that project's ongoing. Uh, Region two uh, recently acquired 2.5 uh, million uh, to allow us to continue with our project to improve I-25 through Pueblo. And the purpose of that money is to allow right-of-way purchases uh, for that I-25 uh, improvement project. Our 2045 long range uh, plan is in uh, final review stage. Uh, we're expected uh, that to go out uh, for public comment before the end of this month and then adoption uh, in December. Um, and uh, this coming Tuesday, uh, we're having our quarterly regional meeting uh, between the city, the county and Pueblo West. Uh, and uh, our rail station study that's part of our Southwest Chief and Front Range uh, Rail Commission project. Uh, that's in its final stages. We have the final draft of that study completed. Uh, uh, they gave a presentation to uh, us as the uh, commissioners, the Board of County Commissioners from Pueblo County uh, this week, and uh, it will be uh, presented around the circuit uh, uh, as the final plan. And then um, yeah, I-25 North, uh, there's uh, uh, some work being done, uh, particularly on uh, replacing box culverts. That way, uh, that work is also ongoing. And uh, that's all the report from Pueblo. Hey, um, San Luis Valley. Good morning, Vince. This is Michael Yon. Uh, Highway 17 and 160, the intersection where the signal is going to be, we have construction ongoing. Highway 17 north, uh, uh, north going into uh, Moffitt, I guess, is ongoing. Uh, locally, Lane 6, the 
is a 16 mile county road that goes into the Great Sand Dunes National Park there. We had a kickoff yesterday on it. So that will be starting probably in the next year, or 2022. We are working very diligent on our airport to get the 139 certificate. Uh, we'll have an inspection next week and that is looking very good. November the 5th, we have our TPR for the San Luis Valley. It will be a Zoom meeting. And we still have Keith on here. I know he has some information on the bus tag and neighbor to neighbor grant. Keith, would you update us a little on the North Park? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Uh, the Chafee Shuttle received a uh, a big grant to do a good study on the Northern San Luis Valley's transit needs because the Chapey shuttle contracts for those. And so it's uh, called a hope grant. It was one of 25 grants awarded nationwide. So we're very happy about doing that. It'll enable us to hire a qualified consultant to do a real thorough study on that and help us with scheduling and identifying hardware needs and everything else so we can better serve that area. Thank you, that'll wrap us up, Vince. Okay, thanks. Um, Southeast. South Central. Yes, Vince, we had a virtual TPR meeting on September 24th where we approved the statewide transportation and transit plans. Uh, we also had a presentation on our Southern Mountain Loop PEL study, um, the final draft. Uh, with the TPR also reopened discussion, re-examining all of Trinidad's I-25 exits after having a presentation on that. Um, projects are moving forward, um, maintenance, sealing and striping on several state highways. Uh, the bridge work at exit 59 on I-25 is moving forward again. And our three multimodal option fund projects are still in the contracting stage. And that's it. Okay, um, Southwest. Good morning. We had our TPR meeting yesterday morning and we also uh, adopted our 2045 uh, regional transportation plan. And we just want to extend our thanks to the CDOT planning staff. They did an awesome job engaging um, folks down here and we have a really useful document. So thank you for that. Um, we saw an interesting presentation on the federal lands planning pilot from the federal lands highway division of the FHWA. Um, they came up with a list of regional needs related to accessing federal lands. So we're looking forward to diving into that a little deeper in future TPR meetings. And then the CDOT Region 5 folks uh, updated us on about seven pages worth of ongoing projects they're working on in various stages. So I know they're staying busy uh, with everything from the 16550 design build, fiber on Wolf Creek, repave. So enjoying the fall weather down here and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Um, upper Front Range. Upper Front Range. Southern Ute. Ute Mountain. I thought Ute Mountain was here, but uh, sorry about that, Vince. Uh, having a little bit of internet problems here. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. For you, Mountain Ute here, uh, there's been no change. We're still working on uh, ongoing grants for some of the projects that we currently have. Um, we did have a new development uh, in our transportation department. Uh, Bernadette Cuthair will be um, leading that uh, department for a while here until we can find someone to fill that position here at Ute Mountain and that'd be my update. Thank you. 
Um, Johnson Valley, that's me. Um, one of the, we did have our uh, TPR meeting on October 1st, and we also approved our regional plan for 2045. So that went well. Um, we talked about a number of different things. Uh, federal lands, uh, Elijah Henley came and did a presentation. <laughs> and talked about the coordination with the federal lands and various other federal uh, agencies dealing with um, BLM and various other things and how we can do better by uh, looking at the projects that are needed around uh, our area and how we can coordinate with CDOT and the counties and the municipalities to get uh, a big, bigger bang for the buck. And so that went very well. Um, one of the other things we talked about is the projects that are going on now. Uh, a lot of them are um, resurfacing. Uh, one of the things in Region 5 is they're going to be working on um, uh, chain, chain uh, areas, chain stations, and doing a lot of upgrades. And so that will be going on uh, as we get it further into the fall. Hopefully, it will be completed before the winter. Uh, Region 3 are doing a lot of things also in terms of service treatment and um, big intersection and delta uh, between Highway 92 and Highway 50 is getting worked on. And also the upgrades or um, some repair work on Highway 92, which is going to be a major detour for a project that we're doing on Highway 50. Uh, it's called uh, Blue Creek Canyon. Uh, from the western side all the way to what's called Windy Point. That's a $40 million project. One of the problems with that particular project is we have some people who are concerned uh, about access through um, Highway 50. Uh, 92 is good, but it can't handle 18 wheelers. So there's gonna have to be some larger detours for them. So there was a meeting put together by Senator Corum and um, a representative of Catlin uh, from uh, our state legislature. Talk about some of those things. And the major thing that seemed to come out there is uh, how, do you, how do we get through the canyon um, and what are gonna be the, um, the actual detours? There's uh, uh, one area there on the western part of the canyon that gets to Arrowhead, which is a large community up on a the mesa there. And um, their access is basically uh, within a half a mile of where the construction is going to start. And, and their access is in the construction area. But uh, they, everybody's agreed that the, that will be done first, and that should be finished by the 1st of July of next year. Uh, bids are out. Bids should be open next week. And hopefully um, uh, the bid, bidder who gets the project will help to alleviate some of the concerns of the people who want to be able to get through there. There was a, an opening a, a, an hour in the morning, an hour at noon, and an hour in the evening. Um, but they think it should be longer and it's only a one way. So that there's gonna be a lot of congestion in that particular area. So one of the concerns that people had is couldn't we do this particular project in a different way? How about a bridge? Well, the area would mean that the bridge would be about a $700 million project versus a $40 million project. And half of that money, the 40 million, from federal lands access program. And so um, that's been talked about before and shot down because of the expense. Another person uh, came up with the idea of, well, then let's put a tunnel through everything. And our chief engineer was there and he commented that would cost a billion dollars. So um, that didn't go too well either. So we're working on it and hopefully once the bid is, is assigned, that we can work with the construction people and work on how we can get through the canyon 
various times of the day. Um, I don't think there's anything out. There's a lot of other projects that are coming up and um, and my, my TPR has two regions involved with it, so they get kind of complicated at the time. Um, so, John Cater, do you have something? You're muted, John. How about that? That's good. There we go. There we go. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, first off, as Herman mentioned, we got the uh, reauthorization um, extent, or not real, we got extension of the, of the fast act. So uh, our reauthorization discussions are, are kicked down the road for another year. That's, that was a one-year extension and at, at the current funding levels and so forth. So um, now we have a, an authorizing act until September 30th of next year. So hopefully Congress next uh, spring and summer will, will address that and we'll get a, get a new bill. We also got, um, as part of the uh, omnibus um, bill funding government, we got a uh, appropriations through uh, mid-December. So we've got program money again for, for that. So Congress has to re readdress that um, after the election, but uh, um, we'll, we'll see what they do there. But uh, hopefully uh, hopefully they'll uh, continue or even increase a little bit our, our funding levels um, on that. Um, I want to make you all aware of a, a meeting that was held like a week or two ago. It was the state um, TIM conference. And TIM is, is uh, transportation, um, oh, no, I'm drawing a blank. Thing. Transportation, um, oh heck, what is it? I'm drawing a blank. Help me out, Herman. I incident. Incident management. In incident management, thank you. And we had, we had 150 people participate virtually. And Tim is a fantastic concept because what we do is we pull together uh, the, the owner of the road. So in most cases, it's, it's CDOT, but it could be c uh, cities or counties. The owner of the road, the, the law enforcement who has to, res to respond to, to incidents. Uh, the first responders, the emergency people, um, towing people, anybody who's going to be involved in these incidents, uh, bring them together as a way to make um, incidents, when we have an incident, to address it in the most efficient manner possible because it's a real, it's a safety issue and it's an operations issue. And wherever you are in the state, it's a safety issue. It doesn't matter if you're in, in Gunnison County or Kit Carson County or Adams County, it's a safety issue because you've got people out there on, in the lanes on the side of the road and they're, they're exposed along with the people who are involved in the incident. So that's, that's a safety issue. The, if you're in a congested area, the, you get backups. And again, those cues are unexpected. And again, we have, we have opportunity for, for uh, uh, additional accidents, um, secondary crashes and so forth. So Tim is a great concept and it's been really successful here in, in Colorado. I think compared to, to many parts of the country where we track how many people we've got trained in, in Tim uh, practices and we are over, uh, over I think it's around 55% of our first responders have all been trained here in Colorado. And that's, that's probably 10th or 12th nationally. So we're not the very top, but we're, we're up there. And that's, that's nice to see. And we're seeing results from it too. We're, we're seeing groups come together where they can um, reduce our, our closure times for, for incidents on the, on the freeways and on just regular roads. So it's a priority for, um, for us here in Colorado. It's a priority for Federal Highway nationally. And it's great to see 150 people come together virtually to help advance that going forward. So if you've got any questions about that, if you want to know more about Tim, um, you know, please uh, please send me an email, give me a call, and we can talk more. But it's a great concept. And going forward, um, Federal Highway's got a new initiative where we're going to be working more with um, non-freeway types of, of opportunities for Tim. So um, again, it could be uh, city streets, county roads, um, lower volume state highways, uh, ways to better address you know accidents respond to them and get get them cleared and get things uh, back to normal so great concept I'm excited to see we had that uh, uh event uh, a week or two ago so that's it for me thanks thanks john as, as karen stewart come back on uh online i do not see uh, uh chair chairwoman stewart on the call okay i was going to give her an opportunity to comment if she had any comments are there any questions for anyone? Okay, that was great. Lots of great information out there. Thanks for uh, sharing that with us. Uh, next item is the uh, budget overview. Jeff. Yeah, thank you, Vince. Good morning, uh, everyone. Um, uh, 
All right. Thanks, Aaron, for pulling up the slides. Um, so, uh, Aaron, if you wouldn't mind advancing to the next uh, slide. Um, so in today's budget update, I'm going to cover a couple of different items, uh, which will be going before the Transportation Commission uh, next week. Uh, first, I'll go over an update to our revenue projections for fiscal year 21 and 22. Um, then I'll review the final changes to the fiscal year 21 budget being brought before the commission uh, next week uh, in order to rebalance the budget in light of our final reconciliation of revenues for fiscal year 20 uh, and our updated uh, uh, revenue forecast. Uh, then we'll conclude by reviewing the first draft of the fiscal year 22 budget, which we'll be asking the TC to adopt uh, in draft form in November. Um, next slide, please, Aaron. <clears throat> So um, our revenue is uh, is currently composed at, at the highest level uh, through three primary uh, funding streams, federal apportionments, uh, HUTF revenues, uh, state HUTF revenues, uh, and revenue derived from the legislature through general fund transfers or more recently through Senate Bill 267 COPs. Um, in prior discussions, we reviewed the impacts uh, to legislatively derived funding uh, and how we offset those projects, uh, those impacts, sorry, by adjusting and reprioritizing our uh, our uh, list of major projects according to the revenue available. Uh, we talked earlier that Congress recently extended the FACTS Act, another yeah, somehow you it's the remaining out. variable that's uh, driving a need to amend the current fiscal year 21 budget. Oh, can you hear me? Now we got you. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so uh, again, we've finished reconciling prior fiscal year 20 revenues um, and, uh, and final figures are showing that for fiscal year 20, uh, HUTF revenue came in about 34 million less than was budgeted. Uh, that is a, a, uh, a larger reduction than we were projecting in June. Um, however, uh, um, in our projections for fiscal year 21 and 22, uh, those projections actually improved, um, showing a slightly smaller reduction than what we were previously uh, forecasting. So collectively, we're showing an impact of about $117 million in uh, uh, HUTF revenues to CDOT across fiscal year 20, 21, and 22, uh, relative to where we were uh, pre-pandemic. Um, next slide, please, Aaron. So about 83 million of that 117 million is in fiscal year 21 and 22, um, which is a slight improvement uh, from about uh, a $96 million reduction uh, across those years um, that we forecast in June. And this is pretty consistent with the most recent forecasts uh, by the Office of State Planning and Budget, um, which also showed uh, a, a, a general improvement in, uh, in our forecasting for 21 and 22 showing uh, probably a little bit stronger economic recovery than uh, than we were forecasting earlier this uh, uh, spring and summer. Um, let's go ahead to the next slide, Aaron. Um, so uh, based on gallons of gasoline sold, uh, this chart is just showing you um, um, essentially gasoline and diesel and millions of, go of uh, gross gallons sold. Um, we estimate the VMT dropped by about uh, 7% in fiscal year 20 relative to fiscal year 19, with most of that impact obviously coming in the, in the final quarter of fiscal year 20. Um, from that lower level, we're projecting that VMT rebounds about 4% in the current fiscal year uh, before to returning to more of a normal baseline level of VMT growth of about a percent and a half uh, in fiscal year 22. Um, next slide, please, Aaron. So what does this mean in terms of the current fiscal year 21 budget? Um, well, as I mentioned, the decline in revenue in 20 moved more severe, proved more severe than initially forecasted. We went from about 17 and a half million forecasted to about $34 million shortfall. Um, however, our forecast uh, for fiscal year 21 improved slightly. Um, since fiscal year 20 is now behind us, um, we need to take the impacts in both fiscal year 20 and 21 in the current fiscal year. Uh, so our combined fiscal year uh, 2021 shortfall increased from about 62.9 million uh, forecasted in June to about 71.3 million uh, that we're forecasting uh, most recently. Next slide, please. <laughs> um, of that amount, about 9 million, about 8.6 million uh, is in uh, faster, um, meaning that those, uh, those reductions flow directly into the faster safety program. Um, and so that means that we have a balance of about 63 million uh, in flexible revenues 
uh, that we have to reduce from our fiscal year 21 budget in, in order to uh, balance uh, against that reduced revenue. Um, next slide, Aaron. So I'm going to kind of circle back to where we uh, probably left off in this discussion uh, in, uh, in August or September. Um, and uh, I'm very pleased to say that we were able to close that remaining uh, budget deficit associated with uh, the HETF revenue um, through a combination of strategies that collectively avoided uh, cuts to core programs such as asset management, maintenance, or RPP. Um, that included about $21.5 million that was uh, the fortuitous outcome of the delay in Senate Bill 267 COPs this past spring. Uh, that had the effect of essentially pushing our debt payments out and leaving us with a temporary surplus of about uh, $21.5 million in debt service that we could use to offset uh, that uh, that budget shortfall. Um, we uh, we worked really uh, extensively with regions and divisions who really looked hard at their 21 budgets and found ways to reduce operating costs uh, to the tune of a little over $2 million. Uh, we also reviewed every single uh, uh, um, budget program, capital construction program, compared that to essentially planned activities during the fiscal year. And we found a few examples where we had programs that uh, uh, timing on projects uh, um, had worked out that we just ended up having a little bit more program than we actually planned to deliver uh, in uh, in the fiscal year. So that uh, that freed up about four million. Um, towards the tail end of the last fiscal year, we really uh, pushed hard to try to uh, maximize reversions. That is basically leftover operating funds at the end of the fiscal year. We we tightened our belt. Um, and uh, and we tried to return as much as we could. We were able to pick up about 16 million from funds reverting in the in uh, at the end of fiscal year 20. Uh, and then finally, um, we had about 21 million in uh, proceeds from the sale of properties uh, over the last year, uh, associated with uh, with the uh, headquarters consolidation in Region 2, uh, uh, Region 1 headquarters, Region 4. Uh, collectively, that was about 21 million we were going to use to pay down. Uh, some of the COP debt on our buildings, um, recognizing where we were with revenue, and all, but also recognizing really historically low interest rates, we instead uh, were able to refinance that debt uh, and put those funds towards closing that budget deficit. So at the end of the day, we actually uh, we actually cut a little bit more um, than we ultimately needed to, based on where our re revenue projections uh, uh, landed. So great news in the sense that we are. Uh, rebalancing our, our budget in 21 to those reduced debt revenues and, and doing it in such a way that is, uh, has avoided, for the most part, uh, needing to cut into, say, asset management or, or maintenance or RPP. Um, next slide, Aaron, if you don't mind. So um, I'll close out 21 and then uh, ask, for some, ask if you have questions before I move on to 22 with, uh, uh, with just one more, um, more item, and that is to uh, um, circle back to the other impact uh, that uh, uh, we had to our budget in fiscal year 21 and 22, and that was the legislative impact. And so if you remember, we talked about this previously, but um, coming out of the legislative session, we saw our general fund transfer to the department suspended for two years, and we saw a temporary increase in our debt service. And so we were able to offset that reduction by essentially reprioritizing our list of major projects. And so one of the actions in the budget amendment going to the commission next week um, to uh, rebalance the budget um, will uh, essentially reallocate funds between our strategic projects program and our debt service to offset that. So with the commission action next week, um, we, will, uh, we will be back in balance in our fiscal year 21 budget. Um, and uh, it's been a long effort, glad to get there, but I, I, I think um, we, we ended uh, all things considered in a pretty positive place in terms of being able to do it in a way that uh, uh, really minimized impacts to our program. So um, I think this is my last slide on fiscal year 21, Aaron, if you wouldn't advance. Yes, it is. So I'll, I'll pause there. I've got a couple more slides on fiscal year 22, but before we jump ahead of fiscal year, I'll pause there and see if uh, anyone has any, uh, any questions on, to this point. Questions for Jeff? Yeah, I've got one quick one. Um, uh, great rebalancing effort and um, and pretty good uh, projection out there. Have you run the electric vehicle impacts on on the budget in the future years uh, against these projections? So uh, specifically, uh, we've got a some pretty aggressive electric vehicle replacement plan, and since we all know that electric vehicles don't contribute to this tax. Um, have, have you run that 
those numbers against these projections? So the uh, the short answer is yes, that is factored in. Um, and what I mean by that is to say that our our revenue model um, does account for uh, for um, essentially the the makeup of the fleet. And so over time, if you were looking out further in our projections, that you know you'll you'll um, you'll see that that fleet makeup in the model will start will increase the number in uh, in terms of the number of vehicles that are that are in the EV category. Um, you know, the, the uh, EV does pay a $50, uh, $50 a year registration fee, about $30 of which uh, uh, goes into the HUTF. So we, we do pick up that uh, projection um, as well. Um, so I couldn't, I, off the top of my head, I couldn't uh, give you the, uh, the, you know, exact figures, but we, we do take into account uh, um, the changing makeup of the fleet through EV, and we do take into account the EV registration fee. Well, Yes, except that thirty dollars is is nowhere near what a conventional gasoline powered vehicle contributes on average. Um, so, I'm, what I'm driving at uh, are you numbers that you're using in the model in line with the aggressive plans for electric vehicle distribution that's in the governor's uh, electric vehicle plan? Another, you know, does your model track the same way you're using the same numbers? Um, so I, at, at the current, um, again, if you look further out, I'd have to look, um, we have not rep updated. I think the, uh, the, I, uh, the, I think the short answer is, uh, we have not updated. I don't think in our model to this point, the, uh, the fleet makeup, uh, the fleet cohorts, uh, to track to, uh, to, to the, to future policy decisions. So I think what we are using currently, um, is uh, is a, a composite of, uh, of uh, various uh, research projecting uh, sort of at uh, at the national and regional level uh, the uh, the change in the fleet over time. I think that's what we're using in our model currently. Um, I will say that when we develop um, in in the short term, you know, current year, the 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 uh, the impact is pretty small. Um, where this becomes much more relevant is when you're forecasting long range uh, revenues. And so when we did the revenue projection for the statewide plan several years ago through 2045, uh, we did at that time have a pretty robust discussion about the assumptions to use about uh, EV penetration. Um, and uh, that uh, 2045 long range revenue forecast uh, reflects those assumptions that we collectively discussed with the planning partners uh, at that point in time. Okay. What, okay. What I'm, what I'm driving at, and I'm still hearing a disconnect, the governor has projected a plan. So you've got a hard plan that talks about some very aggressive numbers. What I'm hearing you say is that you're projecting a different set of assumptions on what you think will actually happen. That's what I'm driving at. No. Those in line, and if they are great, uh, you know, a simple yes is, is, is fine. Uh, but if they're not in line, uh, I, I think we kind of need to see what those... Uh, what those numbers are, how much of a disconnect there is, if any. Yeah. Let me restate that for a second. Um, our short-term projections uh, year over year um, do uh, do not reflect those changes, but the effect on revenue is pretty minimal in the next in, in the current year. Our long-range forecast we do um, uh, every every several years with the statewide plan. So when we did that long-range forecast at the last time, those assumptions, the governor's plan was not available. So we we uh, we used assumptions that were developed in collaboration with planning partners. When we do the next long range forecast, uh, I think we will have that discussion. And that as part of that discussion will be should we we be reflecting the assumptions associated with the governor's plan? Okay, so this is Vince. One of the things that came out in the news a couple of weeks ago was the fact that automobile manufacturers will not be producing gas driven cars after. 2035. Well, some, some manufacturers. Okay, some, but that's going to have a big impact. I'm wondering if how accurate these projections are, and if and if the the, the financial hit that you've got that you've managed through very well, I might add, and my compliments. Um, but but have. Looking ahead, are those assumptions built in together? And I'm kind of hearing that there's a disconnect. Uh, but thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think for the long range forecast, that is true. I, I think there is a disconnect on the long range forecast that, 
we we can revisit uh, when we revisit the long range forecast. Excuse me. Which would be in about three to four years. Correct, unless we uh, unless we chose to do so sooner. Well, I I I think you probably given the uh, the shift out there. There's, you probably ought to have some sort of a better estimate uh, going going forth for next year's budget, but uh, we'll, we'll leave that we'll leave that for now. Thanks. You bet. Okay, if there aren't any other questions on fiscal year 21, I'll move on to just a couple slides on fiscal year 22. Um, so uh, we, um, you know, this part of year is the fun time of year when we're we're working on the finance side in three fiscal years at once. We're closing out fiscal year 20. In this case, we were sort of rebuilding fiscal year 21, and we're also building the fiscal year 22 budget that uh, will take effect next July 1. Um, so uh, the uh, we are bringing to the commission this month the first draft of the fiscal year 22 budget. Um, that uh, that draft, and Aaron, you can I think skip ahead maybe a, a few slides. Um, that uh, that draft um, is uh, available on the uh, CDOT website as well as in the commission packet. Um, it, uh, it we will bring it to the commission again in November and ask them to approve in draft form. The fiscal year 22 budget, um, we have to submit that to uh, the Office of State Planning and Budget in December, uh, but really it does not get finalized until March. Um, and so in the early part of, uh, of next calendar year, we'll be updating our revenue forecasts um, and uh, we'll be making uh, final changes to, uh, to finalize that budget by March. Um, next slide, please. So the uh, um, the fiscal year 22 revenue allocation plan um, and our, our forecast for fiscal year 22 revenue uh, totals about 1.9 billion. That's uh, that's composed of about 642 million in federal funds, about 547 million in state HUTF revenue. Uh, it, it also assumes 500 million from a third year issuance of Senate Bill 267. Uh, and those three primary sources combined with uh, a series of other uh, sources listed on the slide in front of you total about 1.9 billion. Um, next slide, please. So uh, looking at terms of how those funds are allocated in the fiscal year 22 budget, uh, about uh, a billion, 1.1 billion allocated to capital construction, uh, a very big year again for capital construction, assuming we, we, we do have a third year of Senate Bill 267 funds. Uh, about 363 million to maintenance and operations, and about 230 million uh, to sub-allocated or pass-through programs, um, with some of the other uh, smaller categories of funding uh, identified there on the slide in front of you. Um, let's go to, and actually, I think this might be the uh, the last slide uh, in the deck. Um, so I'll just conclude by giving you a little bit of an overview of of uh, what we had to do in fiscal year 22, uh, uh, given uh, current projections. So. Um, calling back to the revenue figures I walked through at the beginning, uh, in developing the draft fiscal year 22 budget, we were dealing with about a $46 million decline in HUTF revenues uh, from amounts we were forecasting pre-pandemic. Um, we were able to offset some of this decline by carrying forward some of the reductions to operating costs we put in place in the fiscal year 21 budget. And we're hoping again in fiscal year 22 as in 21 to really try to avoid the need to cut core programs, uh, uh, like again, like asset management, ma maintenance, RPP. Um, we've initially balanced the fiscal year 22 budget by not allocating additional funds uh, in fiscal year 22 to our reserve and contingency fund programs. Um, we think we can do this not because we think we can get away without uh, a contingency or a reserve, but we think this because uh, where we ended uh, fiscal year 20 uh, and the balancing the 21 budget left us with a very big uh, very healthy current balance in our program reserve fund. And so I think the intent is to try to maintain uh, a healthy balance in the current fund so that we don't need to allocate additional funds to that in uh, in fiscal year 22. So that is, um, that's all I have today. Uh, I'll, I'll come back again uh, in uh, November, uh, give you another update on the, uh, the 22 budget and then um, uh, and then we uh, we go away for a few months, uh, run some new projections, uh, and we'll we'll see where we are at the beginning of the fiscal year. But so far, uh, things uh, looking good in terms of being able to uh, again manage uh, reductions in 22. Um, certainly not without impact, but uh, but we think we've got a way to manage reductions in 22 that will will really uh, maintain funding to those critical core programs. So. 
happy to take any final questions. Otherwise, that's all I've got today, Vince. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Okay, hey, Jeff, thanks. You bet. Thank you. So the next item on the agenda is front range passenger rail. You know, um, ever since I've been involved with transportation, which is in the late 80s, uh, we've always talked about passenger rail on the front range and didn't seem to get anywhere. But I think now we're starting to get some real positive uh, feedback in terms of the possibility of actually putting something together. And so we got Randy is going to talk to us about the front range passenger rail. Well, thanks, Vince. Uh, and thank you all at the stack today. We haven't had a presentation to you for a while, so I'm going to be uh, uh, providing some information today and joining me will be David Singer and Eric Sabina. They've been heading up a lot of the uh, CI staff assistance to the to Spencer Dodge and I on the commission staff as well as as the consultant team in, in moving this project forward. So uh, we've got a lot of information here today for you. And uh, if you can hold your questions to the end, I think David and I and Eric will try to move quickly through this. Aaron, next slide, please. All right, the um, Rail Commission uh, was created back in 2017. Again, two primary purposes. One is facilitating the development of front range passenger rail service. And certainly the second is to uh, continue to make sure that the Amtrak Southwest Chief long distance train uh, maintains its, its route through uh, Southeastern Colorado. Next slide. Again, today we're just gonna cover a little background, uh, go through a lot of the information that we've uh, been developing over the last about 14 months now. The consultant team came on board uh, in August of 2019. Uh, we'll be providing you a lot of engineering, uh, planning and ridership updates, and then uh, a little bit on some very recent public outreach and I'll close with next steps. Uh, I'll turn it over to uh, David uh, Singer right now, and, and David will carry you through the next few slides. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Good morning, everybody. Uh, at the very start, our, our blended team, the consultant team, the Rail Commission and CDOT, worked with stakeholders to identify a vision. What, what's our hope to accomplish? What's our purpose? And, and it's simple and aspirational. It's to provide a choice that's safe and reliable and efficient for folks trying to move up and down the corridor. Uh, our legislative charge, our logical termini is to start with Pueblo to Fort Collins, and, and that's our start. <clears throat> Once that spine or that backbone is in place, there are opportunities to expand that network to points north, to points south, west, and in between. But we need it to start somewhere. Next slide, please. And so when we think about possible new systems within an extremely constrained uh, front range, it's really looking at existing transportation corridors. And so here you see the options that we're looking at and it's freight corridors, it's interstate corridors, I-25 and E-470. Also looking at opportunities in and around RTD's system. And we have the ability to mix and match as we further refine that, but these are the ones that have shown to be um, survive fatal flaw and the ones that have the most merit. And so our engineering team, have tightened up curves to make these compete the best they can. We're working with communities to see um, how this reflects is consistent with their vision. Um, and so we're, this is really the what, and this is how we're thinking about alignments uh, moving up and down this 180 mile corridor. Next slide, please. And so as we think about a new system, there's program improvements, there's policy improvements, there's project improvements. And so there's a lot of different moving parts. And I wanted to spend a slide or two talking about the different elements and strategies that we're using to help advance this vision. We wanna be competitive for federal dollars. We anticipate a federal approval process. And so we're working upfront with federal agencies to understand their expectations and how we can move quickly through the NEPA process. Like I said before, we're, we have our engineering team at the ready and they're working closely with FRA to understand their criteria and expectations for a system, including spacing between stations, 
technology, speeds, grades, and that helps us better define these options. We know that it's a constrained environment, like I said, but we've got a lot of information and existing studies and we have a good understanding of what's out there now. And so it's gathering that information up, up front. Uh, you'll hear from Eric Sabina and talking about how we're coding different characteristics and understanding different scenarios using our statewide travel model. And that will help us with ridership and travel times. And then Randy will also talk about our comprehensive stakeholder engagement plan. It's something where we're talking to the public at large, understanding what their demands and expectations are for such a system, but also targeted uh, communications and outreach with communities, with uh, landowners like the Air Force, with the class ones, with RTD, so that we, those are critical partnerships that we need to um, have in order for this to succeed. And then finally, we're also looking ahead to this next session and governance and what types of authorities or districts need to be created in order to move such a system forward as well. Next slide, please. And so when we need to go through our decision-making process, we have to do it in an objective and empirical way and, and asking four fundamental questions of those alternatives that you saw earlier. And it's first one is how does this perform? What's the travel time? What's the ridership with each of these scenarios? And how does it tie in with existing or planned connections? The next is how this fits into the context. Dropping something like this into a constrained area, what's the tolerance? What's the level of acceptable impacts that uh, such a system has? We wanna be mindful of the context. Third is cost. We, wanna ne we need to know what the cost is to build something like this. We need to know what it costs to operate and maintain a system like this. And, and knowing what the cost benefit ratios are for systems as a whole, including individual segments. And then finally, we wanna understand the ability to deliver something, a system like this. What's the political, what's the public support for each of these? What's our ability to deliver this incrementally? And that helps us make uh, decisions and recommendations. Next slide, please. So from a technical analysis, we're using proven technology. We know it's something that can be built. And so we see that these alternatives are, are technically viable and um, each of them have different partnership opportunities though. They're very, you can see here on the map, they serve different communities, they have different objectives and, and they have different types of impacts and benefits. Uh, the good thing is I've said earlier is that we have the ability to deliver this in phases, we have the, or incrementally, we also have the ability to mix and match. And so these are some early recommendations for us on a technical basis, um, but it really sets us up for some next steps. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So the work that is yet to be done, we have to really, uh, now that we have defined these alternatives, we're costing them out and trying to understand what this long-term vision cost might be, but also what are some of the costs for these initial steps. And we also uh, were awarded a Chrissy grant, and that means we need to understand the interaction between such a system and the freight operations, if we're gonna be operating in and around their same facility. And so that's gonna be another technical effort in the next year. Regardless, we wanna be ready for NEPA. And so we're doing our best to kind of scope this out um, like I said, an agency coordination plan, public involvement plan, understanding what the existing conditions are. And then we already have a head start on what the necessary permits and mitigation strategies might be. This helps us be ready and move quickly through NEPA. And speaking of NEPA, that's when a lot of these decisions are made, such as what the technology might be, where specifically might stations be, communities, but also where within those communities. Uh, we also talk about uh, which ones can be incrementally delivered and what specifically are those service times, you know, what times of day, how often. Those are the things that once we sharpen the pencil and get into greater detail, we can start making those decisions. Um, next slide, please. Oh, so at this point, I, I did want to turn it over to Eric and talk about a very specific part of our project development, which is the ridership performance and, and projections. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Very good. Thanks uh, for uh, taking the time to listen to me talk a little bit on, on this project this morning. Uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to be with you today. Uh, I'm just going to go through some fairly, you know, fairly quickly uh, some of the work we've been doing over getting close to a year now. We started initial work on this uh, analytical process last fall. And I think I, I just want to say up front that you know, just to note that we're kind of in mid project. I think I'll repeat this point in the slide a little further on, but as far as the sort of modeling and estimates of, of demand work are concerned, we're in about mid project. And as you can imagine, you know, the, the planning and the engineering teams, as, as David was talking about, as that, that portion of the project goes along, they are gradually sharpening the pencil on their work. And as they do that, then they provide us, uh, you know, sharper inputs to the, the forecasting tools. And so our results become sharper as well. So what you're gonna see right now is, is uh, uh, more mature work than we were uh, had available last spring when we did our first round of model runs and, and discussed them with folks. Uh, but we certainly will be continuing to, to produce sharper results that are more mature and consistent with the plan of the project as it goes along. Uh, you know, some just very high level uh, comments here. Uh, we we uh, have, have shown uh, through the modeling that there's uh, significant demand for uh, rail ridership, you know, rail service along the Front Range. Uh, the, not surprisingly, since a large fraction of the trips that anybody makes on any given day are commute and work related type trips, uh, the demand is highest for commuters. Uh, but there are substantial uh, uh, components of demand for other types of travel as well, uh, special events as an example, you know, with folks going up and down the front range for football games and things like that, which we all hope and expect we're going to get back to here one of these days soon. <laughs> um, the, uh, the ridership numbers that we've produced compare quite favorably and reasonably when you look at other services that are already operational in other comparable parts of the country. Uh, you know, our, our results compare pretty favorably to those. And frankly, that's one of, the, one of the sort of reality checks that we do when we're doing model runs of a service that obviously doesn't exist yet, is to see whether we are forecasting results that seem uh, consistent with uh, other realities in the rest of the country. And finally, you know, we will see emissions and vehicle mile travel uh, reductions. Uh, next slide, please, Aaron. Thank you. Uh, so this is just a stick figure. You saw some much, much cuter looking uh, graphics from David a minute ago, but this is a stick figure depiction of the three alignments that we are uh, currently looking at. Uh, and uh, we're still, I'm still personally playing with names. I used to just call them three, four, and six but uh, I understand other people don't, uh, don't relate to those names. So the one on the left is, is the, what it used to call three, it's the BNSF rate alignment, and it goes through, uh, you know, from Pueblo, North Colorado Springs, Castle Rock, through downtown Denver Union Station, and then it uh, heads Northwest through Louisville Boulder, and then gets into the uh, 287 vicinity of Longmont and goes North from there to Fort Collins. The, the middle alignment, is, is basically the same thing on the southern end uh, it, uh, and up through uh, Union Station. It then follows roughly the end line uh, RTE corridor through, uh, through the Thornton area and then zigs back again to hit the Longmont area and, and again north of Fort Collins. And then finally, the alternative on the, the alignment on the right is uh, somewhat different from the other two. Again, it's pretty much the same up through uh, Castle Rock area. It then uh, stays more in the I-25 alignment, circles around the Denver metro area on the east along the E-470 corridor, uh, stopping at, Union, or at the airport, and then uh, again uh, cuts back and follows the I-25 alignment for the most part north from there to Fort Collins. Next slide, please, Aaron. So I, I, I promised you that I was going to repeat myself, so here's where I do that. Uh, we are about halfway done. And uh, you know, rough, roughly speaking, we'll be looking at quite a number of other possibilities as the as the plan uh, matures, and as the the you know the leadership of the project uh, wants to examine different possible looks at how the service might uh, might uh, be operated. So, for example, we we have not really done a lot of work in looking at how much additional development might happen around stations and what effect that might have on ridership. 
we expect, you know, we, we, we feel like we're probably in the runs we've been doing so far, looking at a fairly maximum number of trains per day, you know, pretty frequent service. And we will be examining some more limited service scenarios, which of course we expect to carry uh, less ridership, but we also expect them to cost less. So those are, you know, the, the, the game that the, the, the plan uh, folks on the project will be playing as we go forward and try to optimize the service. Uh, we, we are certain to be looking at different sets of stations than the ones you saw in those slides. And we already are, are taking some looks at sensitivities to various things such as fare. Uh, we, uh, initial runs we did used a fare of about 32 cents per mile, which was consistent with an approximately zero operating subsidy. Uh, when we run in, for example, an analysis with uh, the fares per mile similar to the Bustang bus service, we get a ridership increase of up 50%. So the model is quite sensitive to the fares and we think that that's pretty reasonable. Next slide, please, Aaron. So this, you know, this this slide and the next one, I won't belabor too much, but these are the slides where I talk about how great my I and my modeling team are. And you'll forgive me for doing that, I hope. Uh, the, 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 the basic message here is that CDOT's model is a, is a very advanced next generation model. The modeling practice around the world has over the last couple of decades been in transition from a previous sort of simpler and less accurate uh, system of models to a next generation of modeling tools that are, you'll often hear referred to uh, as activity-based models or anyway, you'll often hear that if you hang around with modelers very often. Um, and uh, the, these models we very much describe as behavioral models. One of the things they're trying to do is to depict how people actually behave, how they make the decisions that they make and on what basis do they make those decisions. We use what we refer to as revealed preference data. That's a sort of a fancy term for, we do a survey of people and we ask them to give us a travel diary of the, the, the trips that they made, what mode did they use, et cetera. And we use this very large and rich data set to build these models that, you know, that reflects and depicts how people have actually decided what to do. Um, the model is very detailed in the sense that it models each person individually, it models each household and business individually. So it's a high level of sort of geographic and, and, and demographic and economic fidelity. And we check this model a lot. We have a bunch of other data sources that we match it up against. I already mentioned that we match it up against existing services that, and the ridership that they take. But we look at the model against census data, against the traffic and transit counts that we obtain both from our own work and from RTD and, and from the other uh, transit services around the state. And we have a lot of these so-called big data or passive data, they have many names, but I'll just stick with big data sources. We're also comparing against those. So there's a lot of work that goes into checking to see if these models results are reasonable. Uh, next slide, please, Aaron. Um, I, I kind of already uh, beat this slide up a little bit, so I think I won't spend too much time on it. Just to note that uh, CDOT is one of the, or Colorado is one of the first states to be using this next generation type of model at the state level. Uh, okay, next slide, please, Aaron. Thank you. And uh, you know, I've, I've also sort of talked about this, but I'll hit some of these details a little bit more. In the in this most recent round of model runs that we've done, we've taken advantage of a lot more, a lot of engineering work done by the consultant team and by CDOT staff as well to uh, sharpen the pencil on the details of the alignment uh, grades and curvature and that sort of thing that you know, reflects reasonable uh, engineering standards and requirements for a, a, a service of this kind. We also have uh, uh, looked at the effect of 125 mile an hour technology. I do wanna to hasten to add that that definitely doesn't mean we run 125 miles an hour all the time. You know, we are running through urban areas here and we're, the, the model reflects the, the speed limitations that sometimes happen uh, when we are operating in urban areas, when we're operating at curves and grades and so forth. So all of that has been done in a sort of a realistic way, but you know, this is with top end technology that can at times reach 125. Um, and then, uh, you know, noting as I think I already have, that uh, we are looking at a number of, of, of uh, sort of details of the plans around the stations, where the stations are, what the development might be, parking costs and that sort of thing. Next slide, please. 
So uh, this is our big slide where we I've, I've been sort of teasing you guys with the, the ridership in other parts of the, of the country. And this is a slide that shows a number of those that we felt were uh, reasonably comparable in type of service and, and area to what we are, are working on. And there are an awful lot of numbers on here. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll try to sort of hit the highlights. You can see that our alignments are, uh, are, are in, uh, in green here. And generally speaking, they're kind of in the mid range. You know, front runner is in the Salt Lake City, Wasatch Front area. Sounder is, uh, it goes to the Seattle metro area. Caltrain is from the uh, southern metro uh, north into central San Francisco. You can see uh, Miami, Miami's line, South Shore, Chicago, and so forth. And you know, the big takeaway here is, as I briefly mentioned, that we're kind of right in the middle here. The, the BNSF alignment looks the best at this point, but I want to re-emphasize that you know we are in mid-project here. Uh, we that line alignment reflects a number of more stations than the other two do. The the other two green ones. Uh, it is likely that the the uh, other sets of, of stations will be examined in those corridors as well. So all of these things are a little bit fluid, but at the moment with the runs we've done so far. The one we're showing has the highest ridership at about 9,200 on a typical weekday is the BNSF alignment through Boulder and Louisville and so forth. So um, next slide, please. And I think we're getting toward the end here. I do just want to note that, you know, the, the weekend demand and special events and so forth that are not part of a typical weekday amount to around 20% of the yearly boardings and that we do see some reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, as you might expect, since we're taking a certain amount of vehicle miles traveled off the road. Uh, next slide, please. And that may be the end of it. I think we have, no, I, wanted, I, I do want to emphasize one or two other points. This is a, another one of those probably too many numbers slides, but modelers love this kind of stuff. And I do want to call your attention to, you know, that this is summarizing total trips, not train riders, but just the complete market of trips, how, you know, everybody's traveled by any mode for any purpose up and down the front range. And you can see in acronym form here, the, the uh, MPO regions, North Front Range, Dr. Cog, Pikes Peak, and uh, Pueblo area. And, you know, on what we call the diagonal, so North Front Range to North Front Range, you see that 3.3 million number. That's just saying 3.3 million trips start in the North Front Range and end in the North Front Range too, so they don't leave. Uh, that you can see a, a much larger number for the Dr. Cog area, as you would expect a big number likewise for Pikes Peak and, and Paycog on the diagonal. The key point that was, was uh, also compared against other data sets is that there's not a lot of travel end to end on this deal. Most trips stay within their own MPO or they go to the next one over. There's very little travel that goes clear end to end on this. And that's definitely something that's sort of informed uh, our understanding and, 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 and judgment of the outcomes that we were getting was to look at this overall market and, and, and help us to judge whether the model outcomes for the train ridership then are reasonable. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a pie chart on the topic that I already mentioned. You can see that of the trips, most of the trips are work. There are a lot of school trips and then there are a decent number of other trips. Next slide, please. And I, it says points in semi-closing. There's going to be more people talking after me, but my part of here the, of the presentation is is over on this slide. You know, points that that are key. Speed matters, as I mentioned. Though urban operations can limit it, as as can grades, and we have some of those. You know, Palmer Divide and places that all, all of us are familiar with. Uh, connectivity is is an important thing. People don't basically just people don't like waiting on platforms and at, at uh, transfer points to pick up their next vehicle. Uh, we have examined both Burnham Yard and Union Station. We get better ridership when we have the station at Union Station. And as I noted, we're going to be tweaking things up and down, looking for the sweet spot as the rest of the project goes along. And I believe that does it for me. I'll defer to Randy and uh, David about whether to take any questions now or to save them for later. Uh, let's do questions at the end, Eric. OK, thank you all. Next slide, please. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, we had an online public meeting for the month of July and it was very successful. The consultant team that, that put this out said they do this all the time and this was one of the most successful 
uh, online public meetings. You could access uh, your, your laptop, your phone, your uh, desktop 24 seven. We had this up for uh, 33 days and had almost 10,000 people tap into it. Uh, again, uh, very successful online public meeting. We had several uh, different questions uh, throughout and, and I'll go through uh, some of those in just a little bit. Next slide. Uh, input survey, uh, question number one basically asked, uh, what was the, um, the most important operational consideration for you? Uh, the top two were station location needed to be close to the origin and destination. And the second most was your ability to interconnect with other modes of transportation. These were closely followed by reasonable travel time and affordability and cost. Next slide. Where would you most like to go? Uh, this was a three-part question. You only had these three choices. And downtown Denver was the big winner at almost 60%, followed by the airport at about 30%, and the tech center had 10%. Next slide. Uh, this one basically uh, offered people an opportunity. Again, these were people just online public meeting, and they indicated that the majority of the people responding to the survey said that about 60% would be uh, using the service for recreation leisure, leisure about 28% for commuting, and then uh, some other purposes. Now, you'll see that this is different than the information that the travel model is putting out, uh, but we, we believe that's because a lot of the people that would be taking the trips for recreation and leisure are actually only probably going to be doing that maybe 10 to 30 times a year, where those commuters are doing it 200 plus times a year. So uh, we still believe that the actual number of overall riders uh, on this service will be uh, commuters because of their uh, intent to do it about 200 times a year. Next slide. Again, we had 500 different individuals out of these 10,000 that looked at it, uh, filled out some open-ended questions. And we grouped their open-ended responses into uh, positive, negative, or uh, neutral buckets. Close to 70% of the folks responding were, were very positive, saying things like, uh, get on with this, you should have done it 10 years ago, uh, move this forward, Colorado's the last state in the country that doesn't have good passenger service, et cetera. Again, there were certainly the one sixth of the, the folks that said, you know, don't believe in transit, don't believe in any kind of public transportation. And so they're still out there and they'll be out there for this project as well. Next slide. Uh, this is basically showing where the uh, people indicated they would most likely go. Again, the, the key destinations are the largest uh, destinations, obviously, Denver, the airport, Fort Collins, Colorado Springs, et cetera. Next slide. Uh, again, here's those 503 open-ended comments, sort of grouping them by themes. Again, the most, uh, most of them were in general support, some related to alignment, uh, train technology, what speed are you gonna be going? And then a lot of people asking about what is the uh, cost of the project gonna be and, and how's it gonna be funded? Next slide. Okay. Front Range Passenger Rail really has a lot of momentum. Uh, we've now done three surveys over the last uh, 14 months, all of them coming back with very positive public responses. Uh, some of the consultants are saying they're shocked to see this kind of support for a, for a concept that, that hasn't ever existed within the state. We've got legislative and local elected interest support. Uh, President of the Senate, Leroy Garcia, in the paper a couple of weeks ago indicated he wants to move forward uh, in the next legislative session with possible uh, legislation related to governance for, for front range passenger rail. Uh, there's a lot of exciting things going on with Amtrak that, that we hope to be able to share with you uh, in the near future. Class one railroads, we're meeting with UP and BNSF on a six week basis and they're they're very excited about this project as well and, and sort of doing some out of the box thinking uh, along with the project team. We're also having interesting conversations with Bill Van Meter at RTD and, and some of the RTD staff about possible partnerships with Front Range Passenger Rail uh, and RTD that would move along the interests of both projects. Next slide. We've broken the project out into three different phases, policy program and project. Again, uh, we mentioned earlier the governance, 
uh, is going to be a piece of uh, possible legislation in this next session. Uh, on the program side, we're encouraging all the MPOs and the TPRs to start including front range passenger rail in their long range programs. And we're encouraging uh, folks to do what uh, Terry Hart and the folks in Pueblo have done recently, and that's uh, create a station area plan and make sure that when this train is, uh, is arriving in your community, there's a, a good facility for uh, that meets all of the community's needs and, and that that planning is done as well. Obviously, we're uh, continuing forward with the project. We've got some additional work to do before we can enter into NEPA, and we're hoping that uh, that effort will take place over the next two years. Next slide. We just received a, a Chrissy grant. The commission applied for a Chrissy grant in June and was notified a couple weeks ago that we received an $548,000 from the Federal Railroad Administration to complete the initial uh, service development planning efforts, as well as rail simulation modeling. Since we're gonna be operating in shared corridors with, uh, with the class one railroads as part of this project, that's a requirement before we can enter into NEPA. And again, we believe that after this next consultant contract, we'll be in position to issue a notice of intent. Next slide. These are some of the governance options that, uh, that the uh, uh, commission was looking at last year before COVID. Um, they actually lean toward the middle one, which is, is the creation of, of a front range passenger rail authority or something similar to that. So again, this, these conversations will, uh, will be re-engaging with legislative folks and CDOT policy office folks uh, here in the near future as, as we look toward the 2021 legislative session. Next slide. These are sort of the next steps. Again, uh, as I've mentioned, um, we're gonna be having conversations with legislators and, and key uh, local elected officials up and down this 180 mile corridor between Pueblo and, and Fort Collins. Uh, we'll continue these regular six week meetings with the railroads, uh, RTD and Amtrak on, on some specific technical issues that need to uh, take place before we new, move into the next consultant contract. Next slide. Wanted to share with you too, just some of the, uh, the Southwest Chief Commission's uh, work related to uh, some of the Southwest Chief alignment. Uh, the Tiger Grant, uh, Tiger 9, was matched up with a million dollars by the Transportation Commission. That is underway and uh, the steel that is being laid down, uh, continuous welded rail in, in Western Kansas and Eastern Colorado is actually being produced at the Everest plant in, in Pueblo. So we're providing some jobs for uh, for the Pueblo area through this, this project. The Chrissy uh, 2018 grant was a $100,000 match by the, uh, by the CDOT Commission. Again, that work is now being, uh, the notice to proceed has been issued on that and we're installing positive train control, which is the new high tech uh, safety uh, signal systems which prevent uh, rail accidents. Uh, and then uh, lastly, uh, the commission back in February received a a Chrissy uh, grant for doing a through car alternatives analysis that will extend passenger rail service from La Junta into Pueblo and up to Colorado Springs. Next slide. This is the, uh, the Amtrak proposal that I talked about. Amtrak has indicated that they are creating a new program in, in the federal reauthorization. Uh, that legislation has passed the House and is, is uh, awaiting uh, compromise and, and similar legislation in the Senate. Uh, but what this would do would create a $5 billion a year program for five years to create short distance front range, front range, excuse me, short distance uh, Amtrak corridors. Uh, Ray Lang of Amtrak has been on a national webinar indicating that the Colorado Front Range is the top priority uh, for Amtrak in this program. And they're suggesting that once this is passed, Colorado will be in line for a $2.1 billion uh, infrastructure, 100% federal grant uh, from uh, the federal government to initiate uh, three day, uh, excuse me, three round trips a day service between Fort Collins and Pueblo. Again, this $2.1 billion federal investment we're, we're keeping our eye on, think that's very positive that, that Amtrak has Colorado's front range at, at the top of its priority list. Next slide, please. Next slide. 
Okay. No, I don't think we'll yeah, pass Randy, these are just kind of the detail. Thing. Yeah, we don't need to go into these slides. We can go back to the last slide and, and just wait any questions uh, that folks on the stack may have. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, Vince? Vince, Vince can I ask you? Yeah, thank you. Um, so a couple of things I wanted to address here. First of all, I think it's clear to everybody, this is, this is obviously a very controversial topic that's been discussed for quite some time. And uh, I know Randy and his crew have been working on that for a long time, uh, but still it is controversial for several different reasons. Um, and you mentioned that there is opposition in some of your surveys. Well, of course there is, and there will continue to be. And I think it would be a huge mistake to just simply brush it off as a nuisance that maybe we'll take care of and then eventually go away because it's not. And, and part of the, one of the big issues there, and I wanted, this is my question I wanted to get to, is cost. <laughs> um, you know, we've heard uh, ranges from 5 billion to 15 billion and, and knowing the way things go over the years, I'm sure that number will go up quite a bit exponentially over the years. Um, how is all this going to be paid for? I understand the advantages, and I, you know, if you ask anybody, would you uh, like to have a rail service? I think most quite, most people would say, of course, yes, that's great. But the follow-up question is, well, are you willing to pay for it? Is the thing that uh, usually doesn't get asked, and so that's part of the thing. Now, the other issue here I wanted to bring up is, um, uh, you know. This, the front rail, the, the rail, I guess, is coming in one fashion or the other, how and when and all that kind of stuff is still to be determined. But even at the, the, the most um, shining modeling, it's simply not going to replace vehicle traffic. And part of the concern, at least up here in the North Front Range that, that we have had for quite some time is, is this front range passenger rail project going to try and uh, take funding away from vehicle traffic, transportation issues that, that are still a huge thing in this, in this state and will continue to be a huge thing. Uh, great if we have rail at some time in the future, but I do not envision that we'll ever be without vehicle traffic, at least in the, the foreseeable future. So, our concern is that this does not take away from our immediate concerns of all of the transportation issues that we are dealing with, uh, with our roads and highways. So hopefully that's part of that uh, in your discussions, in your modeling and everything else. And ultimately it comes down to fun funding and financing and uh, the, the vehicle traffic is just simply not going to go away. So those are my comments. Thanks, Vince. Hey, anybody else? Yeah, Vince, uh, just a quick uh, comment from me. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, well, uh, thank you. I, I'm actually on, I think uh, several of you know, I'm on the uh, Southwest Chief and Front Range Rail Commission. And and uh, those, those uh, negative comments, we take those into consideration. Frankly, I'm a big believer that uh, if Colorado is going to continue to grow and evolve the way it is, uh, we're going to have to simply accept the fact that transportation is more than just roads. Uh, obviously, we have a, an incredible funding shortfall uh, when it comes to roads. I get that, but that doesn't mean that uh, we shouldn't be looking at what is the best way to transport people. And, and my perspective is, is uh, as uh, rail gets, uh, uh, passenger rail gets built, uh, it will, in fact, uh, take people off the highways. Now, will it take everybody off the highways? Of course not. Uh, wh what percentage will it take off the highways? Well, we don't know. Uh, that's the, the reason why we're doing all the studies, the modeling and everything else. And we're, we're definitely going to learn more as we go. But the theory is, is uh, uh, rather than continually uh, trying to figure out how to build highways bigger and bigger and bigger, which... Frankly, I've uh, grown up in the Denver metro area. I know that you can only do that so much and you never get ahead of that game. So we have to figure out an all of the above 
uh, equation for how transportation is going to work. And mass transit is going to be a critical component. And uh, this front range rail system, in my humble opinion, is critically necessary uh, where uh, Colorado's uh, population has already grown and where it's going to grow uh, over the next 20 to 30 years. And uh, any, if you've had the opportunity to visit uh, either one of the coasts or even uh, Southern US or Northern US, you're seeing more and more and more reliance on passenger rail simply because people are sick and tired of the gridlock of sitting on the highways all the time. It also is the cleanest alternative for producing the least amount of uh, carbon footprint. And, and uh, now that we've seen the latest statistics that uh, transportation is now taking the lead as the number one producer of greenhouse gases. That's the presentation that we saw last month. Um, this is something that we have to explore uh, uh, as, as a state. So I'm particularly excited about it. And uh, yeah, there were, there were some negative comments. And, and no, please understand, we don't consider that as a nuisance. We take that into consideration uh, and then say, what are the issues and what can we do about it? And uh, so none of these things are considered lightly. But at every time we've done any kind of survey work, uh, there's just an enormous support uh, throughout the state of Colorado, particularly when we show how the front range passenger rail system connects in with the other transit systems uh, throughout the state. And the second thing is, is please, uh, I'm hoping that no one uh, miss the point and, and don't discount the fact that Amtrak has taken notice of what we are doing and they have basically committed $2.1 billion to help us get this front range rail system done. Uh, we're all trying to figure out how to what's the best way to come up with the money. That's a decent uh, chunk of change and uh, uh, they've indicated in a, a national webinar uh, or, uh, last month um, that uh, the work that they're doing, the fact that they've got this as part of their budget that they're trying to get through Congress, they got the approval on the House side, they're, they're getting positive vibes out of the Senate side. Um, and uh, they basically said nationally that Colorado is head and shoulders above everybody else because of the planning work that we're doing here. So anyway, I'm particularly excited about it as with any kind of major project like that. Uh, like this, there's a lot of issues that we need to work our way through. I'm just hoping that we can have more and more and more conversations here at Stack uh, to have a, a, a good feel for how this project is being developed and frankly get the feedback that we just heard uh, from Dave Clark and others uh, uh, that are interested or concerned about this project. Make sure that we do it right. Serious? Yeah, uh, Elise. Well, I appreciate um, everyone's comments and, and just um, tag teaming off of Terry Hart's comments. You know, in, in the Dr. Cog area, um, we recognize that um, it is a struggle to find transportation funding. Um, we've worked at the state level and failed, um, but we are going to continue trying and we need to work at the federal level. And there's no doubt we need more dollars for all modes of transportation. But as, as Terry pointed out, the, the climate roadmap um, that was presented to us um, highlights the fact that we have to um, do a whole lot more on transportation uh, to meet our climate targets that are binding in state statute. And as a member of the Air Quality Control Commission, I know that um, transportation is one of our top priorities in rulemaking in the coming year because that is now the top sector for climate emissions. And it's a sector we've done relatively little on and, and reducing VMT is a key part of that. So we have to expand transit opportunities. And I would also say, and, and while this is currently a Denver Metro and upper front range, um, northern front range issue right now in terms of not being in compliance with the Clean Air Act standard for ozone. It's an issue that um, other people might have to deal with if, if we don't do better about um, improving air quality and, and traffic and along with oil and gas it, it emissions are the two top sources of ozone precursors. And we are getting ready to be um, given the bad air quality summer that we've had this year, we're very likely to get um, redesignated to be in severe non-attainment. And that's going to drive the need, so to speak, for even more um, alternatives to single occupant 
vehicle traffic. So while I guess I think everybody's right to say, well, we have to figure out how to fund this, the fact that there are um, there's an interest from Amtrak and a potential source of federal funds um, makes this more doable to bring rail than um, to just try to um, work on it at the Denver Metro or statewide level. So um, I appreciate the update and the fact that it feels like we're starting to get some, some traction and, and look forward to working with everybody together to figure out how to fund this and the rest of our transportation needs, which um, Dave Clark rightfully pointed out are also acute. Comments? Yeah, quick comment. Dave? Go ahead, uh, Andy. Andy was first. Um, Andy. Yeah, I, thanks, thanks for the, uh, uh, the update. Um, and Terry, I, I think you make a very good point. Uh, the issue I think is why it's controversial is because of the price tag. And, and that's kind of where we really have to take a look at. Uh, I mean, philosophically, I don't have an objection to, to rail at all. I uh, grew up in Southern California and we had the rail, we had a passenger rail from San Diego to LA that ran, uh, I think every 30 minutes. Um, you know, this, this, is, this is not very much different when you take a look at what the population base was at that point to what we're talking about here. The issue that you boils down to, both you and Elise have, have hit on, how do you fund it? Um, and, and a lot of the uh, I, you know, presentation come forward have frankly been a little bit light on that and sort of wishful thinking. And I think that's where you really need to zero in on. I think that's where why it is controversial is because it does have a huge price tag depending upon what you, what you come up with and who exactly is gonna pay for that. Um, it's not a, or shouldn't be, I should say, um, a sub, fully subsidized transportation option. People who are using it should be picking up a big part of that tab. Um, and it's, it's not the same as doing uh, inside city uh, transit options, which are in fact a service, uh, which do have a, a higher subsidy level. Uh, so, you know, where you draw that line is kind of where you need to come down on. Uh, but yeah, it's controversial because of the funding, not because of coming up with a rail line. Uh, and I think one of the ju justifications is that ozone issue. Um, as you know, I, I kind of discount the uh, carbon footprint issue uh, to some degree, but uh, ozone is very clearly uh, something that is coming up and is going to hit us. Um, so, you know, you got my support to press forward. I'm just very highly skeptical that you got to find any way that's going to make it affordable. And that's where I think you need to, need to concentrate and, and come back in. Thanks. Dave. Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate the comments. And, and just to clarify, and you know, one of, one of the reasons it's been controversial for, for some of us have been around for a while is the discussions in the past that seem to have been one or the other, transit or transportation, transit or roads and highways. And that's really the myth that, that hopefully we're, we're, we're getting rid of. And I appreciate some of the comments about, we got to look at the total package it's not one or the other. And if we can make sure that's not the message, I think we're gonna get a lot more traction on this uh, as well as, as the financing obviously is the big issue and the big question that we've all been fighting. So I appreciate the comments and thank you. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Dave. That, I think that's very well put. And I, I literally think that that is the challenge for us statewide is exactly what you just said. Okay, Steve Harrelson. Yeah, yes, I was just wondering, is the, is the rail line south from Pueblo to Trinidad, does it connect to the Raton Pass line or is it, seems like one's Union Pacific, one's Burlington Northern. I wasn't sure if they were connected in Trinidad or not. They do connect to Trinidad. Uh, and in fact, part of the commission's charge is to uh, eventually reroute the Southwest Chief from La Junta into Pueblo and then straight south down along that alignment through Walsenburg to Trinidad. Okay, they read me like the diagonal. book. So yeah. you're right, Steve, they do connect. Great. Vince, Any comment? Yeah, this is Walt well, down in Trinidad. Um, I do want to say that uh, as those, that rail line from La Junta to Pueblo has been proposed, you are gonna find no support from the South Central TPR. 
because basically you're looking at an area in Trinidad that's been looking at how do we take Amtrak and use it for economic development. And that line going, taking the Southwest tree, um, Chief from La Junta up to Pueblo before it comes down to Trinidad is gonna completely bypass Trinidad from all of the front rail. And there's nobody here that's gonna to go to La Junta, then up to Pueblo and then up to Denver and use it. So you're gonna meet a tremendous amount of opposition down here from the, what we have seen so far where people have to run over to La Junta and the people that wanna go north up to Denver are never gonna see Trinidad when they come in on the southeast, on the southwest chief. So just be aware of that. People are not happy down here with the alignment you're proposing. And well, I, I'll take a stab at it. Randy may want to take a stab okay. at it. Uh, uh, I, I, we have uh, a representative actually from Trinidad, uh, Mayor Phil Rico, on uh, the commission. And he is basically a champion for making sure that no one forgets that uh, the state line is south of Trinidad, not south of Pueblo. And, uh, and frankly, I'm, I'm in total agreement with him. Uh, there, it's basically broken into a couple of chunks, basically the Front Range Rail project as well at, that's connected at the hip with the Southwest Chief projects. And uh, uh, none of the proposals that we have uh, are designed in any shape uh, whatsoever to avoid Trinidad. Actually, they are to connect Trinidad. And so uh, I'd encourage you to talk to Mayor Rico uh, when you get a chance and he can fill you in on, on the work we're, we're all trying to do. But uh, um, I, since I'm from Pueblo, I'm particularly sensitive about making sure that we're connecting Trinidad. And uh, Randy and I have had a lot of conversations about that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys. So with that, I think we'll take a five minute break, and then come back and talk about the stack bylaws. So that means uh, I'll back here at 11.01. So take a break guys. Yeah, no, never on a break right now. Okay. Hey, Pat. <sighs>
Okay, I think it's time to get back together. So we're going to talk about stack bylaws revision, and we got John is going to talk to us about that. Uh, thanks, Vince. Hey, John. Okay, so I, I know that a lot of time people start their presentation by saying I'm going to be brief, and then they're not. But let's see if I can really uh, uh, do this. So I, I think this is the third time that we've um, had the uh, the bylaws come back. So hopefully by this time uh, we're in a position to sort of hone in on just the items that uh, were uh, still up for debate. So Aaron, can we move on to the next slide? So at, after the last iteration of the uh, bylaws discussion that we had at the last stack, um, the two things that sort of came up were the options for the officer selection and uh, meeting materials distribution. So next slide, please. So uh, basically we have sort of the uh, option one and option two. Option one is, is, the, is no change. We continue to do um, the hiring of a, a stack chair um, as we've done in the past. And option two uh, would uh, do a, Two, two year term limits, so four years uh, total. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> when we did the, um, uh, the survey of folks, um, this came down uh, of the 10 folks uh, voting. Now there are 17 stack members officially of the survey that went out to all 17, uh, 10 came back and it was a five, five split uh, so this could go either way, depending on who's on the call today um, and if those seven people really have it. Uh, you know, quite frankly, Vince, this could come down to who you select to make the motion, uh, quite frankly. So um, I don't think it's that terribly contentious uh, because on the plus side, people have said, well, we want to do term limits to get some fresh blood and rotate things through. Uh, but on the other side of that, people said, you can do that now. All you get to do is is uh, when uh, Vince comes up for re-election, not re-elect him. So, um, that's where we're on on this one. Um, let's go on to the next slide, um, Aaron, and then we'll sort of open this up for people's um, uh, uh, opinions. Um, next, we had the stack materials. Basically, the bylaws right now say that um, the bylaws have to come out two weeks in advance. Uh, we know that that's not actually happening. So why would we want to have something in our bylaws um, that... Um, is, is just setting CDOT up uh, to, to not uh, be able to uh, comply. So um, after the discussion um, last week, uh, excuse me, last stack meeting, um, I think what we came up with and was verified or, or um, reiterated by that vote that we had of the, the folks that participated, stack meetings will be um, provided one week before the meeting um, and then emergency agenda items can be added with a majority stack vote uh, up at the meeting. This is sort of a um, variation of the option one approval of the agenda before the meeting, except instead of having that approval of the agenda before every meeting, even when we don't need it, uh, this just sort of streamlines the process and that way we only have to approve the agenda uh, when there are new items. So those are the two things that we're chatting about um, at this point. Uh, next slide, please. Aaron, so the change of the bylaws requires a two thirds vote and a two week notice. So this at this point, hopefully is the last time uh, we'll, we'll have a long discussion about this. Um, and then at our next uh, stack meeting, November, we'll go ahead and um, approve um, the bylaws based on our actions today. Um, and then, then we can do the election of officers um, after that. And I think that's the last slide, but one more just in case. Aaron, yep. I think that that basically does it. So at this point, uh, Vince, let's uh, open it up for people to uh, give any of their last thoughts on, on term limits or no term limits, and hopefully we can get someone to um, make a motion that that's what they want in um, one way or the other, and we can get enough consensus uh, that we can put this puppy to bed and bring it back for final adoption next month. And with that, I'm happy to answer questions. And I know other members of the um, bylaws subcommittee are on the line as well. Okay, so let's take uh, the first one, the election of officers. Any comments?
I'm not hearing any. Um, would you like selection op option one or option two? Yeah, Vance. Go ahead, Dave. I, I think we we talked about this. We're we're in favor of option one for the officer selection, just kind of the way it is, the way the way the committee kind of went through that. So that's kind of our feeling on it. Any other comments? We're for oh. option two. <laughs> What's that? Uh, I like option two. Can, can you explain why, Heather? Um, I just believe that, I, and I, I mean, we've, we've gone around in circles, not only as a subcommittee, but in, in this forum as well. And I just think in all reality, I think it would be good to um, give other people opportunity to rise to the top. And I think Vince does a great job, but I also think that when you look at um, elections, it is kind of, it's nice to be seated and know that it's, you know, everybody thinks you're doing a great job, but also it's also nice to have someone step up that may not have been someone we thought we that could and give them opportunity to shine and, and do as great a job as Vince does. And I think that that's um, a great breath of fresh air. I think uh, if I could, Vince, one of, one of the questions we had and maybe the concerns is the timing of when these elections take place. Here in the North Front Range MPO, we, do, we don't change our officers until the first of the year. I think the elections are done at the, the last meeting of December or something, or yeah, last meeting of the year in December. So uh, depending on when these elections would take place, Sometimes we don't even know who our stack representative for the next year is until January. So I don't know how that fits in with your discussions. But that can easily be changed, can it not? I mean, we, you can change when your election occurs to coincide with the stack officer elections. Uh, perhaps, depending on when those are, yeah. I think that that's the, the easiest and formidable solution to a lot of the concerns regarding that. I mean, we at Northwest TPR, we elect in February, so we're in the same boat, but there's nothing that says that we can't change that to uh, November as well. When, 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 these offices, this is, when would the stack officer elections occur? Aaron, can you answer that question? When did the stack officers occur? I, I thought it was in January, but uh, then again, I think maybe in the, the thing we did we have it to what, November or something. That's uh, correct. We had, um, we're tentatively scheduling um, stack officer elections for next month. And, and when, I didn't hear that. Next, next month, that'd be November. November. What a comment. Vince, this is Dean Bressler, and you know I want to add that there were five of us on this bylaws uh, subcommittee, and with support from uh, CDOT staff, particularly Aaron Willis, you know we we deliberated on this quite a bit over the course of I think about or at least three meetings, and and I think I speak for all five of us. I know for John and Heather and myself that uh, option two. We, we, for the, all the reasons that Heather said, plus a number of additional ones, and we felt pretty strongly that option two um, was, was more favorable. And, and while the, the, uh, the survey monkey showed a 50-50 split, uh, I'd like to think with this committee that you know, took the time apart from regular stack meetings to consider this carefully, uh, that that might lean stack toward uh, option two. The comment. This is Elise, and I have not weighed in because I don't feel super strongly. And I think the you know previous speaker, the Heather, made a good case for option two. But I have to say I lean towards option one just because. Um, term limits take away choice. And um, in situations where, you know, the 
there's a power of incumbency or campaign finance issues or whatever. Sometimes you have to to tip the scales, but we're a pretty um, opinionated, empowered bunch. And so I think if we like having Vince's chair and want to keep him have, uh, him being the chair, um, why deny ourselves the choice to have that happen? I, I, I am a supporter of um, up and coming leadership in, in, in most instances. So I, I don't, you know, ardently oppose option number two as a way to sort of facilitate that. But I also think the nature of stack is, is somewhat, um, I want to say unique, but it's got a huge time commitment associated with participating in TC meetings. And, you know, I don't have that time. And, and I know a, a number of other people don't have that time. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that Vince does. And, and so with, with, with um, a nod towards the folks that spoke very articulately for option two, I, I, I lean towards option one. Other comments? Vince, this is Norm. Norm. Uh, so uh, um, I, generally I'm, I'm a support term limits. Uh, the power of incumbency is, is dramatic. And on this board, which tend to be rather, despite what happens at some meetings, we tend to be a very polite group. Um, and the, um, the term limits is, is a polite way of saying that it's, it's, it, we, we'd like to move on without being unpolite to our current leader. Vince, you've done a tremendous job. I nothing just very to say you did a great job. I'm wondering if the stack would be open to splitting the duties of chairmanship with representation to the TC. Two separate positions. Now they could be reside in the same person, but is that is that also an open I'm open to discussion. So generally I'm open, I, I'd prefer option two with a option to split off the duties the staff would, would elect a representative to the Transportation Commission, may or not, may not reside with the chairman. The issue with that norm is that it's actually pretty well spelled out in Article 4 that the stack chairperson shall represent um, to the TC. And I think we're kind of like diving into, you know, changing definitions of, of what we as a subcommittee had already gone through. And I hear what you're saying. I think that that's valid. I just don't know if we're at a point where we want to start changing up Article 4 in their duties. One of, the, one of the things to think about, too, is that there was legislation that was passed designated representation to the TC. I don't, I don't remember if it really said chairman or not. And I really don't want to preserve the pain. I, I know I agree. Three months is a long time to be talking about one issue, especially something just internal rather than the big issues that we would prefer to be involved with. So just throw it out there because I'm trying to be friendly. So, so where are we with this now? John, have you got an idea? Well, I, I think at this point, like I said, um, for this particular issue, it, it seems to be pretty split. And it, at this point, it really could go down, quite frankly, Vince, to who you call on to make the motion. And if you call to make the motion, there's no change. You'll probably, you know, versus the term limits, uh, people are, there, there are probably enough people who are middle of the road. They're just going to vote yes either way. So unfortunately, I think it's one of those things where um, I think we just have to make a decision and, and move on. Um, this might be a vote that's close enough that uh, we're going to have to ask a, a CDOT to call on all 17 named members uh, and, and, and it, take it down. It, it, again, the, the good thing about this is as, as split as we are, again, no matter which option we pick, um, there will still be that opportunity. Again, um, if we don't see term limits, we can always vote whoever chair is out. If we do say term limits, um, Vince, you, you, we haven't started the clock on you yet, so you can still do it for another four years and start thinking about your, your replacement. So um, I think we just need to sort of, somebody needs to make a motion and you need to recognize that person. And then we just kind of go from there. I'd like to call a question. 
But we have a, we don't have a motion yet. Right. Well, I'd like to call a motion then that we do turn option two, two, knowing that you have four more years than at least <laughs> it passes. Okay. So now we're not approving the whole thing. We're only selecting the option to be placed in the bylaws to be approved next month. Correct. That, that is correct. But, that's Rebecca. Yeah, Rebecca. Yeah, I just uh, I'd ask uh, Aaron to confirm. I believe uh, your we were we are due for an election for the chair. Aaron, am I right? I yes. think it was October two years ago. Yes. That yeah, that's, that's correct. correct. So it's not it's not a decision four years from now. No, no, but the, you know if you select option two, that means that that. Uh, if we have an election, whoever is being elected can be elected for four years. I mean, Correct. two yep. years and right. two years. That's mm -hmm. what I was saying. Right, yes. So I, I move that we go with option two term limits. There, was there a second? I will second. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded to include option two to the bylaws for notification next month. It's only putting the wording into what we got to vote on next month. Further and I discussion? think we need to look at, I mean, Rebecca put in the chat box, just in case nobody's paying attention, a side note to consider, it will likely be possible for a stack rep to join TC remotely even after we are all back to quote unquote normal. So that's something to consider when we look at this. For the discussion. Okay. So I thought I saw something that, that had a, a list of people on it. Aaron? Yeah, oh. Vince, I, I have this list if, if you wanted to go TPR by TPR or if you just wanted to simply call the question with a voice vote. So I'm just, just I was just being prepared. Okay, um, let's try a voice vote first. Oh, oh, and the actual vote here. All those in favor of option two to be included into the uh, revised bylaws, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Aye. Nay. Aye. Nay. No. Aye. Opposed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to have to go down the list. Right. Okay, I can uh, uh, chair with your permission. I can just uh, go TPR by TPR. Uh, go ahead. Okay, so Central Front Range. No. Eastern TPR. No. Grand Valley MPO. Yes. And note that on this is Dean Bressler voting for Dana Brosig. Noted. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cog? No. Gunnison Valley? Uh, no. Inner Mountain? I, I did not see um, Bentley on, the, on this. I'm gonna put, uh, let me call it again, Intermountain. I'm gonna put not NP for not present. North Front Range. No. Oh. Northwest. Yes. Intermountain votes yes. Bentley showed up. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Pikes Peak. Yes. Hey, God. No. San Luis Valley. Uh, I heard a beep. San Luis Valley.
South Central. No. Southeast? I don't think Southeast was present. These Southern Ute. I don't think so. Uh, Southern Ute was present either. Southwest. This is Vice Chair Sarah Dotson voting for Phil Johnson. Yes. Upper Front Range. Ute Mountain Ute. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes is the yes is our one. You mountain mute, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, okay. <coughs> one, two, three, four, five. Fails five to seven. Yep, that's, yep, five to seven. So uh, mo motion fails. Okay, I think that gives us consensus that we put no change in there, but if somebody wants to make it official and have a, an opposite motion of no change and vote on that uh, by vice vote, but that's up to you, Mr. Chair. But I think we have what we need from the committee. Okay, so the thing of it is we're gonna have to vote again this, this next month on, on what the final document is. And then, you know, if, if somebody wants to make a change, we can make a change then. Right. Okay, um, materials to the stack. We have two options there, I can't remember. Yes, uh, there's there's basically, there's, there's several options, but this one had a clear, um, Majority uh, in the in the vote that we sent up beforehand, and a, and a clear consensus from the uh, the bylaws subcommittee that uh, we would recommend uh, that uh, it's one week with the provision for emergency um, um, items to be added the day of the stack. So I remember that now. Yes. Yeah. So, so in the interest of time, if someone's comfortable to move that recommendation, we can move forward. But obviously, we can debate this uh, longer as well. So does do we have anybody that wants to speak against moving the subcommittee recommendation? Okay, so we're going to go with option four on that particular thing. So we need the bylaws um, put together in one unit and we'll vote next time. And um, after that's done, then we can vote, we can nominate and vote the vice chair and chair. Correct. That's, yes, Mr. Chair, that is my understanding. Hopefully we'll we'll have the bylaws be one of the first items on the agenda and then the election, the, an item after that. that so, uh, great. Uh, so, thanks, Mr. Norm. Go ahead, Norm. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, as you all know, I'm the current vice chair of STAC, but I myself am term limited as a county commissioner. My term ends in January, so I will be a member of STAC uh, for only two more meetings. So that would open up certainly without uh, prejudice, the seat for vice chair of stack. I will be resigned. I will be term limited as a commissioner and no longer serve on stack. Um, December will be my last meeting. Just heads up. Okay. And for me, I'm willing to serve another two years. We'll have a discussion about that next month. Okay. Thank you. Anything else, John? Uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I muted myself so I because I, I thought it was done. But yeah, unless there's any questions about the process or anything else uh, that I can answer for anybody, uh, we're done. Mr. Chair, we can move on to the next item. Okay. Next item on the agenda is 1601 interchange. 
All right. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. I have it easy today because I'm actually going to turn this right over to Aaron Willis, who's been leading a lot of the outreach on 1601, uh, to give you just kind of an update on where we are in that process and the timing for when we expect um, this to come to stack in, in a more substantive way. Thank you, Rebecca. Hey, hey, there's Aaron. I can see him now. Hey. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, so we've uh, done a tremendous amount of, of outreach on our new 1601 policy and procedural directive. Um, and just as a bit of background, the 1601 uh, policy and procedural directive is how CDOT goes about uh, approving new interchanges on the state highway system. It also covers interchange modifications. Um, so um, yeah, we've had the opportunity to seek input on the revisions from uh, almost all of our MPO partners. Um, we have a discussion scheduled with Dr. Cog's staff next week. Um, and also we're um, beginning the outreach to some of our local governments. Um, and so that will also take place um, later in the month. Uh, and additionally, we'll also speak with the um, Colorado Transportation um, Management Organizations and Associations um, known as TMAs and TMOs. Um, we have a, a call scheduled with them. And all of these preparations really are um, so that we receive a, a lot of input um, ahead of uh, an anticipated presentation to stack next month. Um, and so I'll, I'll, we've received just a tremendous amount of, of input and have been able to incorporate a lot of the great comments that we've received that just make the, uh, what we proposed uh, just a, a stronger version um, so that when, um, when we do present this to, to Stack, it's, it's, it's had a, a lot of review by a lot of different um, stakeholders throughout the state. So um, that's, that's, the, that's the plan um, where we are now um, and if there uh, are other folks that uh, other local governments who we um, uh, would like to who would like to receive a presentation and be able to provide some discussion ahead of stack we can absolutely um, uh, make that happen um, and so uh, yeah all of all those things in anticipation for um, a November um, discussion so with that I'll see if there are any Her questions comments questions Yeah, I'll just I'll just reiterate. Well, maybe folks are thinking if they have questions, the offer to to meet individually with any TPRs um, or even municipalities. We're we're very open to grabbing some time. It's um, actually quite a bit easier in this virtual space to do that. So just reach out to Aaron, and we'll be happy to kind of walk you through the draft and and get your input. <laughs> any other comments? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to the, to the next item, which is the multimodal option fund update. Uh, Rebecca. All right, I have it easy there again. Um, Michael Snow, I will call on to give you all an update on where we are with MMOF program. Michael. Okay, sorry about that, folks. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, always works until you actually are on the spot for it. All right. So, uh, good morning. Um, so, I did. Uh, I think the last time you had a, a, a bit of an update on the multimodal options fund program and the progress on projects and so forth. Um, it was a, about three months ago, I think it was in June, uh, Rebecca and Jeff Sidmeyer provided some information there. So we wanted to just get uh, give you all a periodic updates and um, you know we may just do this every quarter. Uh, so what I report to you today, uh, we'll also share with the Transportation Commission. Um, but some of the important things, and again, I'm not gonna talk very much because I think the, the memo uh, says just about everything we need to say today. Uh, but the important things are uh, just to see the progress and, and most importantly, to understand 
the urgency of delivering some of the multimodal options funds projects because as everyone knows they the funding behind those which was given in two different years of appropriations uh, they do expire at the end of five years and uh, so projects were, are expected to complete by the end of 2023 but as the memo explains uh, we're tracking very carefully on the progress of projects getting um, their uh, IGAs or contracts executed and anticipated start dates. And then with uh, the information we have uh, in terms of expected durations, we are very closely watching to see what that implies for the longevity of program of projects and how much of them may likely extend into the FY 2024 period when we have limited funds. Um, so uh, it, it, we're just tracking that and, it, and it's partly an FYI, but it's important also because I wanted stack representatives and stack, um, you know, the MPO and TPR organizations to understand the, uh, the importance of projects staying on track um, simply because the, this is different from any other program we've ever really had, such that the TPRs and the MPOs are absolutely fully responsible and have all the authority to decide what to do with those funds. And because they uh, could potentially expire, if there are projects that uh, have unexpected setbacks, cancellations due to either COVID-19 uh, revenue impacts or otherwise, um, TPRs and MPOs really need to be at the ready and have close communication with those local agencies to know when those situations arise and be prepared to uh, consider what to do with unprogrammed funds or funds that might uh, end up being returned back to you uh, because of program, uh, other projects being impacted. Um, so I re that was probably the most important thing I wanted to just point out and, and see if there were any questions about that um, or perhaps to, you know, if there's any TPRs and NPOs now that have situations and perhaps they want to just ask questions about that or you need our support, uh, let us know that now and uh, we'll, we're happy to support you. Um, any, any questions or thoughts <coughs> or using so, about yeah, that? Go ahead. This is, this is Vince. My TPR is one of those that has some extra money left over. The plan, our plan is to make sure that the projects that we approve have sufficient funds for getting contracted and then see what's left over. If there's any other project that want to jump in, understanding that they have to be done by 2023 June. Right. So, we understand that, so we're working on it, and we're trying to keep that up front. Okay. But, but you know, other other comments. Uh, Michael, this is John from PPACG. Did uh, yep. uh, we have that uh, error where you showed PPACG oh. having extra money? Did Did you already reach out to Dr. Cobb? Yeah. yeah sorry, I should have I should have started with that. Yes, of course, they made at least uh, one error in the memo. I mean, it would be unnatural to be totally perfect, but I incorrectly stated that it was the Pikes Peak region that carried uh, 951,000 of unprogrammed uh, funds currently, and that was uh, incorrect. It's actually the Dr. Cog region that still has that portion unprogrammed. And as Vince mentioned, uh, Gunnison Valley, the other one with some unprogrammed funds currently. Other comments, questions? Okay, thanks, Mike. Yeah, thank you all. Okay, um, we're almost done now. One of the things I want to remind everybody is a survey went out, re survey requests went out to all of the uh, stack members. I think, I'm not sure if there's more people if you haven't filled it out, you need to fill it out because it's really helping planning department to think about what the next process is going to be. Again, I mentioned 
earlier that we're going to be into it in about another three, three and a half years. Um, do it all over again. And one of the things that part of this whole process is going to be telephone call or interview uh, with everybody. Talk about what their answers might have been. And the thing of it is, is the calls have not started yet, but they will start shortly. We're hoping to anybody that has not filled out that survey that they fill it out and, and uh, email it back. Now answer questions. Anybody have anything else come before the stack? Okay, uh, next meeting for the stack is November 13th. So that's November 13th. Any other comments? Random thoughts? Okay, then I'll, I'll say that we're adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thank next you. Month. Thanks, Vince. Thank you all. Thanks, Vince.